On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. Tommy Labriola, the Toronto Blue Jays organization. Tommy, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate your time. Tell the listeners about yourself, if you would, please. Cool. Chris, thanks for having me. Um, like you said, I'm Tommy Labriola. I work for the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, my current role is on the strength coach for our high A affiliate in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Prior to joining the Blue Jays, I was a college baseball player at Salisbury University, which is also where I kind of got my start in strength conditioning. Uh, interned there under Matt Nine and was fortunate enough to go back for another two years after and be a graduate assistant there. Um, and throughout those times, I also interned at University of Pittsburgh, Georgetown University. Um, and then in the fall of 2019, I got hired by the Blue Jays and been here since. So I'm, I'm in my third season, um, second with the Canadians here in Vancouver. Nice, man. That's awesome. I just saw Matt uh, a couple of weeks ago. He was out at Fenway, got him some BP passes. He was out on the field and yeah, talking a little bit of shit. Yeah, dude, the Salisbury, the Salisbury tra- uh, tree is starting to get crazy. It it's is. All over it the is. Place. Yeah. So talk to me uh, about, like, being a college ball player and, like, what kind of got your interest into strength and conditioning. And I, for anybody that's listening that may not know, like, you were one of my players when I was a GA there. So in advance, sorry if I did something <laughs> stupid that <laughs> may or may not have affected your career, but – uh, hopefully my influence rubbed off a little bit, at least got you in the strength side, if, if nothing else. So Yeah, for sure. Uh, when I was playing, I was definitely a weight room hungry guy. I loved being in the weight room. I loved lifting. Um, and that was a huge part of my game and definitely a huge part of, uh, I think, some of the small successes I had in college. Um, and like you said, you were my strength coach. And um, we, we had a blast in, in the old powers weight room. And I think that is kind of what struck my interest of like, okay, this is something you can do as a career. Um, so you were a huge resource for me. And, and I, I asked you a lot of questions and saw you were getting into baseball. So kind of picked your brain on that. And that was something I wanted to go for. Um, and then just kind of set my sights on, on the path I wanted to take. And, and a lot of people have asked like, what was it like spending your GA at the same school you played at and coaching some of your teammates and, was that kind of challenging to kind of step over that line of being a player to being a strength coach with the same guys. And it was actually really easy for me because, um, you know, kind of a lot of people saw me as a leader on that team. So when I became a strength coach, it's it kind of, everything fell right into place. Um, and it was a blast and worked with a bunch of different teams there too, not just baseball, field hockey, uh, football, a um, little bit of volleyball here and there. And, and uh, women's soccer was also huge in, in my development as a coach, just getting out there and working with uh, with female sports. So, um, you know, I always have my sights set on baseball, but, uh, you know, working with other teams was a blast as well. But having that, that base of knowledge of the sport has definitely helped me along the way. Yeah, I would say I was in the same boat. Like, I, I kind of always knew I would go towards baseball, but – having those other teams under my belt and working with a bunch of different athletes and learning some new sports that I, I didn't really know much about, I think just helped me with my communication skills so that when I I did ultimately get to pro ball, there was not just only one way of coaching people or only one way of speaking with people or, you know, that, that kind of approach helped me. Um, In terms of like, once you transition from college to pro, Mm -hmm how did the training change? Like the pro ball setting, the, the, sometimes the weight rooms aren't good. Sometimes guys aren't as motivated. They're playing every day or college setting. It was like, I, I know firsthand, like you used to get after it all the time. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. How, how did that um, like mindset shift work for you? Was it a struggle at first? Was it just like, oh, okay, I kind of get it. Like, how did you play that one when you were getting into pro ball? Yeah. I think uh, one of the funny things was, um, when I came out to shadow you for a couple of days and knowing yourself as a college strength coach and a pro strength coach. And the first thing you told me was, Hey, just a heads up. I'm a different coach than I was in college going from screaming and yelling and being crazy in the weight room to, to being, you know, the, the typical pro ball strength coach. 
um, it was good to see that. But going from from college to pro, I think there's a there's a huge difference in in who you got to be. Um, everybody comes from uh, a huge different background uh, on your team. You keep 30 guys and you have 30 different backgrounds. So having the understanding of where everybody is coming from and you need to be a different coach from person to person. Um, the schedule is, is way different uh, in college. You know, you're going to get the guys maybe Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but your lifting schedule might change in pro ball from week to week or even day to day. So that was definitely a big change of, of having to adapt on the fly. Um, but also you got to figure out ways where you might not even have a weight room. Um, you're training on the sidewalk outside of the clubhouse with some kettlebells and bands and maybe a trap bar that you brought on the road. Um, we just got we just got home from a two week road trip and tried to bring a, a whole road gym on the road with trap bar, plates, barbell, kettlebells, bands, um, a little cable pulley system. Um, so going from having a consistent schedule, having a weight room to uh, inconsistent schedule and having minimal equipment to train with sometimes was definitely an eye opener. Um, and one of those things that at the beginning can be a little frustrating and you're like, wow, this is, this is pro ball. This is, this is what we're operating with. But then it becomes one of those things that's really fun and you, and you find ways to get the job done with the players um, and keep them engaged and keep them bought into what you're trying to do over a long season. Um, and especially, you know, in college, you're working with people who might have one or two year careers here. You're trying to play 132 minor league games instead of 40 college games and you're trying to keep people healthy to make it through the levels, the training becomes a, a lot different. Yeah, I would agree, man. I, uh, we just played in Pittsburgh the other day and one of their pitchers, I actually had him in my first year in rookie ball and we were catching up during BP in the outfield. And he was like, man, you remember when we were in Bristol, our weight room was like a concession stand at a, at a high school football field. And I was like, Oh yeah. So let me tell you something, man. I can't forget that. I'll never. <laughs> that was my my first year in pro ball, and that was my first experience. And I, I felt the same way. I was like, man, this is this is all we got. Like these are the resources we have. But then you get to a point where you almost embrace it, and you're like, we used to call it the dungeon. And my manager and myself and our coaching staff, we would all work out in there, and we get after it. And like guys would get in, and we'd be you know sweating and breathing heavy, and they're like all right, coaches are getting after it in here. Like, I think we can too. And, you know, yeah. you, you eventually embrace the chaos of it and, uh, you know, and the lack of resources that you have sometimes in the minor mm -hmm. leagues, especially at those lower levels. And yeah. I think the lessons you learn there and the adaptability you learn there will help you as you move up in the system. So sure. as, it, as frustrating as it is, like, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> stay the course and, yeah. and, and embrace yeah. all of that and you'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm fortunate to have the weight room I do in Vancouver. We have really good space and we have good equipment as well. But, you know, I still have trash cans out catching leaks and water coming up from the floor and dirty floors. And we're under the stadium, which is outside. So it's like early in the season, it's freezing late in the season. It's humid in there, but it makes going back and training guys at camps in the Florida very easy when you have the, the facility we do. Oh, for sure. So let's ride with that. What is your best professional baseball story that you have so far? Either something that makes you laugh or something that makes you smile or something you're proud of. Just what's the best story you have so far? Man, mine is one of the ones that makes you laugh now, makes you shake your head and kind of slap your forehead sometimes too. But it actually just happened to me about a week and a half ago. So uh, we just started a, a road trip and one of our players got hit by pitch and um, we had to get him some x-rays and um, the, our athletic trainer needed uh, me to go to the emergency room with him. So I ended up going to the emergency room with him and we're sitting in uh, this emergency room, which is in a, a different town and all sorts of things start happening. We're, we're in there for, I think a total of six or six and a half hours. And we saw people coming in screaming and yelling, um, talking about alligators chasing them, the floor being hot as lava and it's burning the skin off their feet and, guy coming in, you know, no shirt on, no shoes, blood running down his face. And here I am just sitting with the player, like, can we just get some in imaging done and just get out of here? And we're looking at each other like, one, are you seeing this? And two, uh, where are we right now? What is happening? So every, we, you know, we sit there for hours and hours and hours. We finally get called back. We get the imaging done. All is good. So we got a good result there. No problems. I think it was one in the morning at the time. Both of us had missed 
post-game meal. We're starving. Um, we get a ride back to the hotel. And I was like, look, man, I'm not your strength coach for the next 15 minutes. We're hitting McDonald's. There is nothing else open. We had no choice. So we crushed just a little bit of McDonald's and go to sleep. And, you know, that whole experience of just being there with them and uh, being through it, it was it was good that we got the result we wanted, and it was just hilarious to go through. And the next day, we both walked in the clubhouse and just looked at each other and shook our heads because we knew what happened the night before. And that's one of those things where next year, year after, when I see him again, at either if he's at a different level or see him in the fall, every time we see each other, the first thing we're going to say is, man, remember that night in the emergency room? Um, so that whole experience is, was just hilarious to think about. I can relate, man. I had a I had a guy in rookie ball. He took uh he took like ninety five to the knee, and trainer was like, "Hey, can you go? Can you go with him to the emergency room?" I don't even remember where we were, and yeah, just sitting around and just look, looking around at what was going on. And I was like, "Man, this is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, just uh, just you never know, right?" And like you're just no. sitting around and. You're, you don't know what's going to happen. And I was like, dude, I, I don't know what to do. I can't help you. Yeah, me either. I, I'm here. Yeah. I'm having the same experience. You are buddy. Like it, yeah. he's like, can we just get back there? I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, yeah, <laughs> we're yeah. just going to, no. we're just going to embrace this moment and just see what. Yeah, happens. exactly. Exactly. So, that's awesome. Uh, what do you believe in within strength and conditioning that others think you are crazy for believing? Maybe I'm crazy for this. Maybe I'm not, but you know, I'm, I'm a believer in things like trust, consistency, quality, those types of things mean a lot more to the development of your players over the long season than the actual meat and potatoes of your program sometimes. And what I mean by that is you can write the best program. We all know this. You can write the best program, but if your players don't trust you or, you know, they're not consistent in what they're doing or they're, they don't have quality in their training, then Really, it doesn't matter what you wrote down on the paper or what's in the, the programming app that you're using. But if you can get your players in there consistently, they can train with quality and they trust what you're doing, I think you're going to get results more times than not. Um, and that's something I fully embrace, especially being in, in the minor leagues where you never know what you're going to get. If I can get touch points with the players consistently, I, I think we're going to see some good results. So, you know, I do don't get me wrong. I think we write great programs here at the Blue Jays, but um, I think uh, the, the quality of our training and that I feel like our players trust what we're doing means, means a lot more than that. Yeah. Our head guy here talks a lot about uh, creating the environment for players, right? Um, if you have a really good program, but you don't create an environment that um, encourages them to come to you, like it doesn't really matter, right? Like if you have 50% of your guys doing the program and yes, they're getting 50% of the results, but you're missing that other 50% because they're not interested in coming in. Like that's half your team. That's a very important, you know what I mean? And that could be a very important part. And so having, having the ability to create that trust with players, get those touch points, like you're talking about, just having a good solid environment to come train. And, and again, sometimes in the minor leagues, like, yeah, you have trash cans out collecting leagues mm -hmm. or you have a million fans running because it's hot in the in the weight room. Like that's still part of like creating the environment. Like yeah. you're seeing something that this is gonna cause a disturbance for the player. Like, look at I'm doing my best to try to minimize this for you. And like, oh, okay, like, yeah, it's hot in the weight room, but he does have that fan over there for us versus mm -hmm. like, hey, no, like suck it up, it's hot, you'll be fine. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, exactly. I, I agree a hundred percent. Yeah, I uh work for Dave Terry at Georgetown University for one of my internships and he was a, a phenomenal leader and mentor and one of the things that he always preaches is he always says it's about the program not the program and what he means by that is it's about the program you're trying to run and like you said the environment you're trying to create rather than the X's and those that are on the on the paper and that was one of the biggest things that he preached while we were there and I learned from him and it's definitely something I take into my everyday is we're, we're trying to create a, a program here um, every day rather than the, the piece of paper. Yeah. And I, I think the magic happens when you have a good environment and you have guys that want to come in and train and want to come in and listen to you and you mm -hmm. have a good program as well. Right. Like yeah. that's, that's kind of where all the magic happens is like, you're putting exactly. together this good program. Guys are curious about it. They're like, all right, I'll give it a try. They really like it. They like the results they're getting and then they keep coming back. And then the next guy that's, 
kind of on the fence sees this guy making some gains and he's like, Oh, let me see what he's doing in there. And yeah. the next yeah. guy comes to you and it's, it's just kind of like the, you know, you get the, the, the ball rolling and all of a sudden you got everybody in there and they're like, they need everything for you and, or yeah. from you. And it's just, just a good way to get going. So I think creating that good environment and then adding in that really good programming together makes for, makes for, for the sure. best of both worlds. For sure. So what do you believe uh, makes a strength and conditioning coach successful? Maybe just in general, uh, in any setting, like college setting, for instance, or specifically in the pro ball set? Yeah, I think in general, as strength coaches, we're, I think we're leaders in the team and the clubhouse and on the field. Everybody looks at the strength coach as a, as a leader. And I think to be successful, one, you have to be able to lead. You have to have those qualities as a leader, but you also have to be able to lead while wearing many different hats, um, especially in, in pro ball. You know, you, you might do the sports science stuff at the same time. You might be a dietitian and a strength coach, and you might even do some athletic training techniques. You never know. Um, but being able to wear all those hats and be centralized as a strength coach and lead, I think that's what makes someone a successful strength coach. Um, specifically in pro ball, I think it's just being a team player. We're, you know, we're, we're one staff and we have a, a big affiliate staff. I think we have somewhere around nine or 11 staff members here. And, um, you know, being a team player to, to make sure we're all pulling on the same rope and, and getting to the goal that we want, I think is, is the biggest thing to be a successful strength coach. You know, you're going to have to sometimes step outside of, of what you normally do and, and help somebody else out where you never know that person might come and help you out. But being a team player every day for 132 games is what's going to help you be successful. Yeah. I'm on this big kick lately where like, I don't think any one person is above the game, right? Like the only way we're not going to play today is if the players don't show up, right? Like the mm -hmm. players are the ones playing the game. So everybody else is kind of a secondary piece, right? Like if I don't come in today or even for the next week, like, guys are still going to run. They're still going to lift. They're still going to use the weight room. They're still going to figure out a routine for themselves, whether I'm there or not. And so for me, it's very humbling to, to be like, yes, I'm, I'm part of this team. I'm a very small part of this team. And I can't let my ego get in the way of like the ultimate thing, which is the players, right? Like helping the mm -hmm. players. Like even if the manager didn't show up, the hitting coach didn't show up, the pitching coach, the trainers, like if the trainers didn't show up, like, Guys would figure out how to get their own ice or tape mm -hmm. up themselves or just not like worry about things. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. for me, I, I've just been trying to like take this little bit of a humble approach and like, Hey, we're all in this together. And ultimately like we're all here for these players, which I think comes second nature to strength coaches, right? Like we always say we're servant leaders. We put mm -hmm. the players first. Um, but we have to make sure that our actions match our words. <laughs> I think sure. sometimes like there's big shouting matches, you know, whether it's on social media or in real life of coaches mm -hmm. trying to make their point be heard. And, oh, this guy has to do this to be successful. Mm -hmm. And like there's plenty of guys that never lift weights. They never run and they're still very successful. And there's guys that put in a ton of work in the weight room and a ton of running and maybe they don't reach their potential, you know, and there's mm -hmm. everybody in between. So. I think, like you said, being a team player, having a humble approach is, is definitely a great way to be successful. And then being able to wear all the hats, like you said, especially mm -hmm. in the minor leagues, it's just everything kind of falls on the strength coach. And it's it's yeah. funny that like the even the schedule, right? Like if the if the meeting goes, if the players meeting goes long on hitting or pitching, like you might have to shorten up stretch to get everybody back on schedule, right? Yeah. Like you're kind of kind of steering the ship appropriately and keeping everything running smoothly without like openly like, Hey, like I'm the guy, you know what I mean? You're right. You're right. Exactly. So you have to, you have to be able to, to navigate those waters. You have to be able to like speak with everybody in the clubhouse. You have to, like you said earlier, it's like coaching each guy is a little bit different and you have to approach each person a little bit differently. And you have to know how your manager ticks, your pitching coach mm -hmm. works, how your hitting coach communicates how every player does things. And then if you get ahead of them and you know, like, Hey, I, I know my hitting coach is going to want this guy to come in at three 30. Like, let me see if I can get him and be like, all right, he's ready to go at three 30. Mm -hmm. Like those are the victories that make you successful. Yeah. And then yeah. the, the clubhouse sees you as like, Oh, okay. This guy's on top of the ball. Like he's got his eggs in a row. Like he he's good. Like mm -hmm. no problems. Yeah. So, yeah, agree. exactly. I know. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. I know my manager here, he's a, uh, 
very organized person and he loves the schedule and making sure that everything is detailed on the schedule, which is great for the staff and the players. And so it's like those small things where he'll come and say, you know, can you make sure you add this to the schedule? And it's like, boom, already done. And he's like, you're the man. So it's just, like you said, knowing the little things that make everybody tick uh, is huge. Yeah. And, and like I said, once you get ahead of those, it, it makes your job a lot easier. And then it just mm-hmm. makes the day run more smooth because you're, you're already ahead of everything that might, uh, might throw a wrench in your plans. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then one guy shows up and he just throws a major curveball and you're like, I wasn't ready for that one necessarily. Yeah. Uh, what advice do you have for others in the field? Maybe young coaches looking to get into pro ball or just older coaches that just want to stay on top of things. Just any mm-hmm. advice you have. Yeah, I'm still, uh, still seeing myself as a young coach. I mean, I'm only going into my third year of professional baseball and second season because one of them was COVID. But I think, one of, one of the things that's helped me out along the way throughout internships, GAs, and now where I'm at now is I, I've been surrounded by people who think differently than me. Um, I've worked with different types of, of leaders. I've worked with different types of sports. For example, when I was at Georgetown, that was a football internship. And at the time, I knew that I wanted to get into baseball, but I also wanted to do something different. I didn't want to just be super narrow in my in my thinking or just work with baseball along the way because you never know where you're going to end up um so whether it's going out to a place that you never thought you'd live before and interning somewhere there or working with a sport that you never thought you worked with or you never really had any interest in um or just going and learning something that you you also didn't think you had any interest in well open your eyes and you'll you'll learn something that you you'll definitely be able to use and value along the way but um, be around people that think differently than you and because you're going to learn something from them. We have a lot of people in our staff here who come from different walks of life and they may have a specialty in something that you don't. Um, and so, you know, we never have the answers, never think you have the answers and learn something from everybody you work with um, is my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, I think that's a really good one, especially in professional baseball. The I think like the point you made about having just a big staff with a lot of different backgrounds, like, in in professional baseball is really cool and it's like everybody's working on the same game and everybody's working with the same players but we all have different lenses of how we see the game we all have different lenses of how we see training and you know we have for for instance here we have a guy who's really into speed training we have a guy who's a really sports science type we have a Mm -hmm. guy who's really into nutrition we have a guy who's really into um like pri and we have a mm-hmm. guy who's in the fascial training. Like there's just a bunch of different guys on the staff. And so for me, I think it's awesome. I can just go to a guy and be like, Hey, have you, have you looked into this? Yeah, I have. Can you send me something on it? Boom. There's some research to me or some thoughts on it. And I, I think, like you said, it's good to be surrounded by different people. And even if you are in the same game, like professional baseball, there's so many strength coaches on the staff. Mm-hmm. They're not all going to be the same. Right. And the, the reality is if they all do think the same, like, maybe you have a problem, right? Like yeah. You might want to have some, some different thoughts come into your org. And then, you know, like you said, and we talked about this earlier, it's just working with different sports and working with different populations of players and just making sure that, like you said, you never know where you're going to end up. And, mm-hmm. you know, for instance, the Salisbury tree for us is really big. Like at some point, one of the GAs that I worked with could call me and be like, hey, you want to come work volleyball at my school with me? Mm-hmm. Like, Sure, I'll try it. You know what I mean? So you, you, you yeah. just never know. And being surrounded by those people. And I think part of part of this is like being open minded and being willing to learn from those people. Right. Like if you yeah. are surrounded by a bunch of different people, but you're so close mind, close minded to the way that you want to train and that's it. Like it's not yeah. going to matter who you're with anyways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we have we have the same thing. We have staff members who are very interested in uh, whether it's speed and agility or the conditioning side of baseball or the meat and potatoes of a strength program or the assessment side or the tech side, you know, I'm going to go to each one of those people and say, all right, what, like, what makes you so interested in that? What can I learn from you? Um, And that's how I've learned just from being in baseball, in baseball, my short time in baseball. Yeah, there's plenty of good resources around um, to learn from in in baseball, especially like that's what kind of this podcast is, right? It's like there's so many strength coaches who have done 
the same job but done it slightly differently mm -hmm. and so they all have their own kind of unique twist on how they do things their own unique perspective um and it's kind of my job as host to like get those perspectives out and like hey tommy's got this and i listen to him like oh okay i actually hadn't thought of that even though we're kind of doing the same job like that's that's a good little nugget let me write that down mm -hmm. so this is just kind of an easy way for coaches to learn from each other within the same setting and the same context so yeah. um it's good that you're open-minded it's good that you have a, a ton of good people around you and, and i know some of the guys on that staff and they're all solid mm -hmm. um and it's only going to help you grow man as, as you go sure. in the game and as you get older and you get more experienced and then you hopefully teach the next generation of you know tommies that are coming up through the mm -hmm. system kind of a frightening thing <laughs> uh all right let's let's run with the, the the theme of learning and education so where are you going for continuing at are you reading any books attending seminars seeing a podcast like where are you going for your own learning outside of maybe talking to your staff about things mm -hmm. yeah i'm more of a verbal visual learner type hands-on uh, that's how i learn the best and how i retain the most information so um you know, this past off season, we did a lot of hands-on work. We went to a uh, PRI course, um, a myokinetic restoration one. We did an online FMS level one. We did an in-person FMS level two. Um, all great resources. And while I was at Georgetown, we did uh, some online stuff with body tempering. Um, so for me, it's, it's the online or in-person seminars, like that type of stuff that I learned the most from. And and regardless of people's opinions about what this organization is doing or what this group is trying to teach, what certification, this, this, and that, I think there's something you can learn from every single one of them. You might, you might go there and you might only take one thing, but you never know when that one thing is going to help benefit one of your players one day. Um, so those are a few that have been really beneficial, and I've been able to pull some pieces from each of those and use them now during my season, um, and they've been good good resources to learn from as well. Um, in terms of books, I think one of the best books I read, and I actually read this as a college athlete recommended by one of my assistant coaches, Ron Sires, um, How Champions Think by Bob Rotella. That book is um, incredible when it comes down to how to be a champion in your sport, but also in life. And it's something that has stuck with me um, all the lessons involved that he teaches in there in that book. Um, and I think about that book all the time and I, I, I go back and um, kind of remember the lessons I learned in that. And it's something that as an athlete, yeah, it works, but also in life and in my current job, you know, how, thinking like a champion is going to help me every day get better and also make the players better. Um, so there's some continuing things I've done recently and, and some things that helped me in the past and every day I get to use pieces from them. They've been, very beneficial yeah right on man. i think the, the the big point there is just you can take anything you can learn from anybody right like you can take mm -hmm. something from anybody and like you said whether you agree disagree with everything that gets taught i think sometimes with the seminars people get so tied into like oh we we did indian clubs and i'm only mm -hmm. going to swing indian clubs it's like no that's just a small part right like yeah so yeah. we have i mean even like for us like we have all of these different pieces of equipment we have, we have Indian clubs, we have water bags, we have 3d straps. We have, you know, I've done FRC, we've done mm -hmm. FMS. Like we have all of these things so that, like you said, that one time, one point in time where a player comes to you and is like, Hey, have you done this? Or, Hey, have you heard of this? Like you're educated enough to speak on it with them and, or show them some things that like, Hey, I, I, I have noticed this. Like, can I show mm -hmm. you a couple of things with these? Like, Oh yeah, that's awesome. I like this a lot. And then, you know, I, I had this moment literally last week. One of the exercises I showed a guy, I saw him out on the line and he was doing it before the game. And I was like, oh, you like those, huh? And he's like, dude, I'm going to do these every day. They're awesome. I'm like, All right. That's a win for me, right? Like, yeah. you, you know what I mean? You never know when something is going to click with a player and, and just make mm -hmm. sense to them. So having all of those tools in your tool belt without going overboard on any one specific thing, I think is, is probably the correct approach, at least in my yeah. mind. Yeah, I agree. So, all right, let's uh, let's do a lightning round if you got time, and then I'll get you out of here, and you can enjoy the rest of your off day. Sure. Cool. Sounds all good. right. All right, buddy. Four questions, long or short of answers as you want, and then we'll be good. So, first one: Who is your biggest influence in the field of strength and conditioning? Oh man, I gotta go with the goat, Matt Nine. 
I mean, he, he has been a staple in my career. He gave me my first opportunity to kind of run my own teams. And he's, he's still there. He, uh, he's always a phone call away anytime I need him um, or a text. And he's one of those guys you call for something small. And two hours later, you're like, man, how did we get here? But every time you hang up, it's like, that, that was awesome. A hundred percent. That's what I was going to say is if you're going to call him, you have to set aside yeah. like, at least an yeah. hour because it's going to yeah. go. Exactly. Yeah. He's, he's been a huge mentor and leader for me. So I got to give him all the credit for where I'm at right now. hundred uh, percent. One piece of equipment to train with, what would it be? Got to go barbell, push it, pull it, squat it, hinge it, be explosive with it. Love it. Good. I'm proud of you for that one. Uh, what is your biggest accomplishment professionally and or personally? Oh, this is kind of a tough question. I don't really, you know, feel like I've accomplished a ton in my career. Um, you know, I'm still, still new to all this, but I think honestly, just getting my first job in pro ball was an, an accomplishment for myself. It's something, you know, not that I feel like I'm better than anybody because I work in the pros. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that it was a goal I set my sights on seven, six, seven years ago, and now I'm here living it. Um, and there's plenty to accomplish within the sport. But for me, you know, saying before I even had any experience that I wanted to do this, and now we're here, I, you know, that's I'm pretty proud of myself for that and um, feel like that's a big accomplishment. Last one, any career other than strength and con conditioning, what would you choose? I – I grew up in a, in a family with police officers and, and military and growing up, I always thought it'd be cool to work some sort of law enforcement. Um, so if I wasn't a strength coach, I think I'd be out there doing some, some version of law enforcement somewhere around. And still lifting on the side. Right? And still getting jacked. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, it's been awesome to catch up with you, man. I, I'm, I've been really enjoying following you and following your career. And i I mean, I knew even when you played, as soon as you wanted to, you know, get into strength and conditioning that you'd eventually end up in pro ball. And I, I, I really do think you have a very bright future in this game, man. So it's it's good to watch you grow. And I'm excited to continue watching you grow over the years here. Uh, if the listeners want to get in touch with you. Where can we get more social media? A good place or is there somewhere else we should go? Yeah, I'm not, I have social media. I'm not very active on it. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, my email is, is best. You can email me at tommy.labriola at bluejays.com. Um, always on that and feel free to reach out about it, about anything. Open book, love to talk shop. So um, if you email me there, I'll definitely get back to you. Beautiful. Well, I appreciate your time, man. I, I know off days are really valuable and you've taken a little bit of, of your time to speak with me is, is much appreciated. Our friendship is much appreciated. And like I said, I look forward to watching you grow, man, and hopefully seeing you in the big leagues someday. And we'll talk soon. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate everything you do for the field as well. This podcast is awesome. Um, anybody out there who listens to this, I know is, is getting some good wisdom in. So thanks for everything you do as well. Appreciate it, man. We'll talk soon. Yep. See ya. All right, everybody, that's going to conclude this episode with Tommy. I hope you enjoyed this one. I thought there was a lot of really good information in it. And it was interesting to hear how he made the transition from college ball to pro ball. Uh, and I think he's somebody that you're going to want to follow. I think he has a really bright future in this game. Three things that I took from Tommy in this episode. Trust in the program, consistency of training, and quality of work will all go a long way in helping players develop physically. To be successful, you may have to be a leader while wearing multiple hats and surround yourself with people who think differently than you do. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll talk to you again on the next one.